Okay, really excited to have Daniel Vitalis with me. Great to see you, Daniel. Thanks for being here. And, yeah, man, um, thanks for the opportunity. And you're in Maine, right? I am, man. This is uh, where I make my home. I like to think of it as the, um, the back corner of the restaurant where you can uh, take a seat and see everything that's happening out on the floor, you know, being up here in the <laughs> Northeast. It's like the furthest back corner and I can look out at the whole United States, you know? Yeah, it feels like it's good to have a back corner right now. Yeah, I think so. Right. So, so yeah, I was sharing a couple different things with you. Um, I just want to kind of, you know, no, no, no small order, but kind of just kind of assess how do we uh, kind of get out of the situation we're in as, as humanity and what's, what's, where are we and what's the way out and kind of just exploring on that kind of macro level. And I know that it relates to the personal level as well. So things we can do personally, things we can do on a collective level. Um, and I was sharing with you too that um, I've really been uh, a part of the non-duality world and uh, the spiritual pathway. And um, my explorations have been, I mean, I've explored multiple things, but Eastern spirituality, yoga, meditation, mindfulness, Zen, uh, Taoism, Buddhism, um, to name a few. And Delving into that realm, I think what I've been explore, what I've been interested in is is truth. What's the truth, and how do we transcend suffering, right? Mm. And so um, I think for me, what's been valuable about that pathway is I've realized that so much of our suffering comes from our own mind, from our own consciousness, um, and I would say people in that realm, they tend to, the, the irony is they tend to think a lot and talk a lot and have a lot of ideas about how you shouldn't have ideas and how you shouldn't think about things. And <laughs> yeah. It's all very kind of funny and interesting. Mm -hmm. So then that leads me to rewilding, right? So rewilding, um, well, why don't you define what rewilding is for you and how, how you perceive it and how yeah, you came I'll, into I'll, it? I'll start a lot of people off by sort of you know, actually, let me just back up first and say the situation we're in, we didn't get into overnight. Right. We didn't get into with an election. We didn't get into with the founding of the United States. We did, We probably most realistically got into with what we call the Neolithic Revolution. It's always, I've got to keep an eye on those revolutions sometimes. Uh, the Neolithic Revolution is the shift from uh, hunting and gathering to farming, and it's roughly 10 to 14,000 years old. And it happened kind of uh, at different times in different places in the world where human beings left their traditional life way. And when I say traditional life way, and when I talk about how we got into this mess, it's really good to take a big picture, a, a big history view of humanity. One of the pitfalls that a lot of us fall into because of we come from agricultural societies is we tend to think in terms of civilization, which is a project that's existed for about 6,000 years. And of course, if we were to get into the work of people like Graham Hancock or something, they might argue it's older, but not significantly older. Even if they doubled that, we know that the human organism, uh, Homo sapiens sapien, our form, we've been around about 300,000 years. That's the current science. Those dates get pushed back a lot. So. You know, when I first started talking about things like this, it was 200,000 years. Now we're at 300,000. So let's say civilization, the creation of city states, that's what civilization is. Let's say it's 10,000 years old. So we've been around like this long and only this long, we've been doing this thing called civilization. Now we tend to think historically of ourselves in those terms. And I think it's a huge mistake. And here's why. All the civilizations of the past have been farming people, have been agricultural and that shift is more than just putting seeds in the ground. It shifted everything about our life way. The other 300,000 years have been spent hunting and gathering. It's a much more harmonious relationship with the natural world and with the planet. And more deeply, I think, or at least pertaining to our conversation, it's a life way that's in alignment with how our psychology, biology, and physiology are all, they were all developed in those conditions. And the agricultural lifestyle is so radically different that it's set up a whole bunch of challenges whereby we, um, our lifestyles in direct conflict with what our body and our mind and our spirit wants. 
And we keep pushing harder and harder against that wall, trying to get what we want, but it actually is like trying to get to Mexico, but driving to Canada. It's like, you got to all go a long way before you're going to end up in Mexico, right? You're going the wrong direction, but we keep pushing harder and harder. So let me try to like bring some of this back to perspective as far as like rewilding. The idea of rewilding to me, and it means different things to different people, is the idea of recognizing that the modern human being is like the domesticated form of Homo sapien. And the analogy that I like the most, of course, there are many we could use, but the one I like the most is of our best friend, the dog, Canis lupus familiaris, which is the domesticated subspecies of the gray wolf. So if you think about the gray wolf, that is the progenitor of all domestic dogs. All domestic dogs come from that one animal. Uh, they don't come from coyotes and they don't come from foxes. They come from only from gray wolves. You look at the amount of variation that can come out of a gray wolf in the form of a dog. It's pretty astounding. You know, some 500 plus breeds, almost tremendous variation of size and shape and coloration and all those things, but they all come out of the genome of the, of the wolf. Similarly, the wild progenitor of modern day humans probably most accurately would be the hunting and gathering people around the world. No one particular group. I'm not calling on any one particular group. So I'm not saying, you know, the native people of Africa or the native people of the Americas or the native people of the Polynesian islands or of Indonesia, but, but all of them represent wild humans. And why I say wild, I don't mean it wild, like wild and crazy, but I mean it like living in wild environments and carving their living out of that by living off of wild species. What happened 14,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, somewhere in that time frame, is people kind of got this idea of clearing landscapes, planting certain crops that they had domesticated over time, rearing domesticated animals, and then beginning to war against all of the hunting and gathering people to take their territories so that they could expand their farming operation. And this project is almost complete. We're almost around the whole world now with this project. There's just these little holdout pockets left. There's some tribes in Africa. There's some tribes in Indonesia. There's an island off the coast of uh, India. It's a few more places where there are still hunting and gathering people. In other words, the Neolithic revolution is an incomplete project. It hasn't actually completely revolved this revolution, but it's almost complete. And when it's complete, it's like as if we will have eradicated the wolf and all that's left is the dog. And maybe the dog forgets that its true calling was in the wild, that its relationship with wild places is what formed it. Instead, it only remembers its life with its masters, you know, and we're kind of coming up upon that. What's interesting about many of the beautiful religious pathways you brought up earlier Taoism, which of which mm -hmm. I, I really I do really appreciate Taoism a lot. Um, Zen, Buddhism, any of these, they are all religions born out of agricultural people. So they all bring with them assumptions of agricultural peoples. What's interesting is if the attack on suffering is suffering caused by that life way. And if it's a lack of acceptance of certain realities of living on the planet probably most notably that the only way for you to survive living here on earth that we can empirically really show. I know there are people who like to claim about, you know, Baba's living in caves in the Himalaya or something, but from what we can all see and determine and show to be true, all humans live by eating the body parts of other things. That is a, a inescapable you could say, well, no, I'm a vegetarian. I only eat the body parts of plants. Well, I can assure you that plants like to keep their body parts, right? Um, you could be like, I only eat you know, rice and beans. It's like, well, where those rice and beans are grown was habitat that was once where wild species lived and they were cleared away for the growing of these things. There's no escaping it. Ultimately, things die for us to live. And so how much can suffering really be escaped on a planet that's set up with those parameters, it might be that we haven't integrated it fully. So rewilding part of it for me is integrating that knowledge that there's no escaping that, not in this dimension where we live, that's how the rules work. And uh, rewilding is sort of about accepting 
the rules of nature and then saying, how do I live harmoniously with them? As opposed to the agricultural lifestyle, which says, how do I live? How do I overcome nature? I don't like what nature grows. I want to grow what we grow. I don't like what was growing here. I want to clear it away and grow something else. I don't like how our natural life way goes. I want to change everything about it. That's what we've been doing for 10,000 years. And we've, like I said, we're not here today because of an election. And we're not here today because of a virus. And we're not here today because of, a, a, you know, 200 years of slow erosion of something. We're here today. For, it's a 10,000 year unfolding. Well, that what you said is interesting. It, it, it does parallel my um, studies or explorations or inquiry, if you will, as well, which is that acceptance, acceptance, when we don't accept what is, that's when mm -hmm. the psychological suffering happens, you know, so I like to make a distinction between pain and suffering, you know, pain is something that's in the moment. Um, and then when the moment's over, it's over. Um, and then suffering is something that you know, we're still kind of still carrying it and we have this, you know, this thing and yeah. what this happened six months ago and this happened a year ago. And yeah. um, so that acceptance and yeah, it really feels like we are, we're so far off of this, this idea of acceptance. Like, I, I mean, I'm interested if, if you, if you'd like to share your, your ideas of what's happening with the virus and the approach that's been taken as far as uh, lockdowns and, and, and social distancing and masks and um, vaccines and you know like from a perspective of rewilding does this does this does you, do you think this is the, the right approach does this make sense to you or do you see a different way of uh, approaching viruses yeah there's an interesting concept in virology it's the idea of a virome so it's like a biome Mm -hmm. Virome is the, you know, the collective viral load of, let's say, of the planet, or your personal virome would be the viral load in your body, or we could talk about the human virome, which are all the viruses that we carry. And, and uh, we've definitely dealt with coronaviruses and have for a long time. And um, we've dealt with lots of viruses <laughs> over time. Um, I don't want to comment too much on this because I think a lot of it, it's really obvious. I, I really like the parable of um, the emperor wears no clothes. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with that story? And yeah. I love that idea uh, in parable form that you could get people by repeating something enough to all report something that is different than what they're actually witnessing and observing. And I think that collectively that's going on right now because people have no compass anymore or the compass is so dusty or demagnetized or depolarized that they're struggling to navigate through a really foggy environment. And so they're following the only beacon, which is like a repeating voice telling them the same stuff over and over and promising safety. And people tend to flock toward that. But I think if we dust off the compass or, or wipe off our eyes and we look around, the reality on the ground does not match the story. And I guess really all I want to say about it is um, trusting what you see and feel and know versus just what you hear is really, really important right now. Um, on the topic of rewilding, I've been trying to find the source quote for this, and I just haven't been able to dig it up. I've been looking all week. I uh, recently listened to an audio book about um, the uh, Comanche living on the plains and uh, at the time where they were warring with the early United States. And, and one um, Comanche warrior who had been brought to Europe and come home, he was talking about what he learned, you know, when he was in Europe. And he kind of gave this list of, of things of these domesticating influences. But the final thing he said was that I learned that a man thinks with his head and not with his heart. Uh, yeah. And I think that we have to be really careful about that. You know, neurologically, as I'm sure you're aware, our heart is a, is a brain, just as our gut is a brain. We have a lot of nervous tissue, not just in our head, but in our hearts and in our guts. And that idea that poets have talked about since writing 6,000 years ago began, the idea of um, feeling with your heart or that idea of a gut instinct those things need to be reawakened because the brain is easily fooled. And I think what we're seeing right now is that a lot of people are not accessing their heart or their gut. And so they're being easily fooled because the mind is such a maze, you know, as you know, from meditating, 
And you know from some of these, these mental technologies that we call these Eastern religions, right? They, uh, they show us that the mind is a monkey and that the mind is a maze and then how complex and how easily fooled we are by our own egos and by other egos. And so, yeah, I think that um, what we're hearing is not what we're seeing and people are believing what they're hearing and not what they're seeing. And mm -hmm. yes, I think that we're quite capable of dealing with novel diseases. Um, we have for a very, very long time. Um, but, you know, if you look around, this it just seems like it's about a lot more. And we're seeing tremendous consolidation of power and we're seeing tremendous transfer of wealth. And we're seeing, in some way, we're seeing fear strong enough to crush the human spirit for some. And... Um, I think we just need to be really wary of all of that. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a huge, the, the fear, the anxiety, the worry, um, just getting amplified more and more. And this kind of notion that somehow anxiety or worry is going to be helpful. That's going to be a good or thing. Healthy. <laughs> <laughs> it's healthy for you. Right. Yeah. But, 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 you know, civilization, society is kind of based on that concept right it's sort of this this idea of um how how on a, on a you kind of went into it on a on an external level the agricultural movement or sorry the the hunter gathering into the agricultural but on like a psychological kind of consciousness level on the inner level what is that shift that happens that goes from being wild in our consciousness to being domesticated in our consciousness yeah, I can. I want to just make sure I I make this clear of why I'm into this stuff in the first place. So I'll just yeah. just say because because we didn't talk about it when we began. Uh, for listeners who don't know me, you know my interest in rewilding has led to a kind of a practice. I like to call it. I don't think of it as my hobby so much, but I think of it as my practice, which is hunting and gathering in the modern world. It's not my exclusive lifestyle. It's not the only way I eat or anything like that. But just before we got on here, I was processing sea ducks that I hunted yesterday. And, you know, I'm eating wild food just about every day of my life. And, th and that practice keeps me deeply connected to nature. And nature's not a liar. Nature's not a politician. You know, nature's not um, a hierarchical structure that dominates either. It's none of those things. Now, What's fascinating about, I was just talking about the Comanche. So it's a, it's a good instructive, um, this applies everywhere in the world, but we'll, we'll talk about Native America when Europeans came here. Europeans came out of Europe where they had been domesticated for many thousands of years. The domestication process was well underway. So think about the difference between, let's say that we tamed a wolf cub and then that wolf cub had cubs and we tamed them okay, they might be somewhat well-behaved, but how much in comparison to a hundred generations of domesticated dogs, how much more tame are they? So the Europeans having had many, many centuries of domestication, what ends up happening in those systems? This is how all the agricultural societies set themselves up. They set themselves up as hierarchies. And so you have at the top of that, some kind of ruling class and usually a priest class and usually then a military or enforcement type policing class. You'll have a trade class, mercantile stuff. Eventually you'll get down to like a peasant class. So it's like a pyramid structure. This is really foreign to the human spirit, which is does not work like this. So what we see in native, and we know that because we can see this transculturally. So it's not just, you know, native Americans. It's not just native Polynesians. It's not just native you know, folks of Australia, we see this around the world with all the tribal peoples, that the individual is sovereign. And for people who don't know what that means, like a sovereign would be like a king or a queen, right? You're a sovereign. Now, that's not to say that they didn't have leaders because they would sort of elect a leader or multiple leaders for different roles. So you might have a peace chief and you might have a war chief and you might have, you know, these are hardly idyllic, perfect societies, but the individual is sovereign. They might have a leader, but they don't have to listen to the leader. There's no enforcement from the leader. If a leader wants to make a decision that the individuals don't agree with, those individuals are free to leave and go find another foraging group within their tribe and language group, but be like, that guy's gone crazy. Or sometimes they'll turn around and just kill him 
or laugh him out. But the individual, this was a huge challenge for Europeans because they came over and they'd be like, we want to talk to the chief. And then they'd try to make a treaty with the chief, not understanding the chief has no power over the individual. So when the individuals wouldn't comply, they'd, they couldn't get their heads around it. The point of all this is to say that in the domesticated paradigm, the agricultural paradigm, we give our power over to leaders. Um, and we expect them to make us, to keep us safe. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, we do. And so this is, this is not how humans have lived through time. The bulk of human history is living as sovereign individuals where you're responsible. Certainly you're interdependent. So it's not to say that uh, everybody's a rugged individualist, actually the extreme opposite. What happens in agricultural societies is the elevation of the ego. And what happens in tribal societies is the uh, repression or, of the ego or suppression of the ego because uh, group survival is so important. So the idea is that the tribe is more important than you. In the agricultural society, you are more important than the tribe. However, in the agricultural society, you're arranged in a hierarchy of who's the most important ego versus in these other societies where it's the culture is what's most important and the preservation of it, the children are the most important thing, the future generations are the most important thing, remembering the ancestors is the most important thing. So we actually have these two competing paradigms. One is the one that's like, imagine trying to run, you know, iOS on a Dell. It's like, that's what we're trying to do here is we're trying to run operating software on ancient hardware that doesn't run that software. And when we run it, we have all of these problems that, and this is my opinion, at least, that emerge as neuroses that we then try to treat rather than looking at the root of it, which is that we've been living out of alignment with what's our biological norm. Um, but through time, the art form of using fear to steer behavior has been, I don't want to say it's been perfected, but it's certainly been advanced. So that what we're seeing today isn't really that new. It's just the new iteration. This kind of thing, unfortunately, what we're seeing today follows a pattern we can see having happened many times in history uh, where it's sort of like create a problem, offer a solution that leads to what you're actually trying to achieve. And, and unfortunately, people fall into that again and again and again. So I, while I'm not claiming to be a fully rewilded mind, I don't know that that's possible. I, I have toilets and a car and bank accounts and all those kind of things, you know, so there's like one foot in both worlds, but my mind's rewilded enough to think more like a sovereign. And so to understand that um, what we're seeing today is more control than it is about freedom. In fact, it's really interesting to watch how the handing over of freedom for safety is happening again, again. I mean, how many times? So right now it's funny how basic freedoms like here in the United States that we've always had are being, are, are looked at as maybe dangerous and very controversial. So to the sovereign mind, it's like, you know, you see through that really quick because how could my freedom be dangerous or unhealthy? Well, a couple of things come up for me in what you're sharing. Uh, so yeah, what I was, what I'm getting at is it, to me, it seems like, uh, civilization is based on fear. Like, it seems like that's the, on, on, a, on an inner level, on a conscious level, you, cause if you're not afraid, then you're not looking for anyone to protect you and make you safe. And so there's no, there's kind of no more civilization if there's no more fear. That's my sense is like, it's kind of the foundation of it is really this kind of underlying fear, anxiety, you know, we need, we need, we need the protector to come in. Um, so, so that's one thing. And then the other thing about this acceptance, uh, which kind of goes into that is to, to me, the rewilding consciousness embraces danger, right? It seems like that's like a, that's an element that where the society is like, there should never be any danger. You never encounter any danger. Danger shouldn't exist at all. And the rewilding mind is like, you no know, danger is a part of, of life. And I embrace that being a part of life. And the, Kind of the paradox is that in me embracing danger, I'm actually not afraid because yeah. I'll just deal with it as it arises, right? Yeah, that's um, there's a lot there. I was talking and podcasting today with my friend Donnie Vincent, who's 
a hunter who travels into the Arctic Circle a lot. And he was saying exactly what you just said, which was he was the way he was framing it was that the more easily everything comes to you, the more depressed you become and the, the less alive you are. And the more that you encounter danger, but prevail, the more bright life actually f- appears to you and the more brilliantly everything comes alive. And he was talking about that many of the situations he goes into are self-imposed suffering to a degree, maybe not as you define it, but, but, you know, going into cold, wet, dark sure, environments, yeah, you know, yeah. struggle, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that he comes out euphoric and so alive. And we were talking about with the advent of, you know, I just push a button on my phone and things are delivered direct to my door as opposed to the old way, which is you go out and you really earn everything. That's how, what's what we're set up for. That's what our dopamine systems are set up for. We go out and we earn everything through challenge and struggle and cleverness. And um, it would be a mistake to think that uh, tribal peoples are less evolved than humans, right? That there's a, than modern humans are today in our civilization. It would also be a mistake to think that civilization is synonymous with uh, peace or um, higher learning or any of those kind of things. Because the reality is that civilizations have all been uh, always been warring, right? And created uh, far grander atrocities than anything the tribal world has ever done. I mean, for sure, the tribal world is also known for warring, but not at the genocidal industrial level that every civilization has. Um, so we, we often use the word civilization incorrectly. It, defi- it refers to city-states and then the creation of giant nation states, it is not a reference to um, being well-mannered, right? We use it like that. Um, Also remember that if we could go back 300,000 years ago and find one of the early humans and bring them here forward to today, you could train them to fly planes or, you know, do brain surgery. These are humans. You with me? Like we have a tendency to think of cavemen. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about modern humans. We've been around 300,000 years, you know. Um, to say that all this, the foundation of civilizations is fear is like, it's a piece of it for sure. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of it too, though, is hubris. And it's um, what in uh, the Judeo-Christian Bible, the story of the Tower of Babel, the idea that you got these people who get together who want to be more powerful than God or don't want to be subservient to God. So they build a tower to try to reach the heavens themselves. And it creates a tremendous catastrophe. Uh, we have something similar in the Atlantis story, right? That the idea of like uh, the, the myth of Atlantis, where it becomes such an advanced civilization and eventually the sort of sorcerer magicians start playing with the controls a little too much with hubris until the point that the whole thing comes unraveled. Um, you look at sort of what civilizations are like right before collapse, where they're at the height of their hubris, you know, where they think it could never happen and then it's actually already underway, right? Uh, one of my favorite stories is The Sorcerer's Apprentice, where Mickey Mouse gets Merlin's hat and he starts to play with the magic, but he doesn't actually have the internal discipline or wisdom to wield the magic. So he creates one problem. I don't remember the scene from Fantasia where he ends up with all the buckets and all of the mops going around. He's trying to clean up the mess. He's using more magic to clean the mess. Each time he does, he creates another problem, which he then has to create a solution for. That creates a problem. And before you know it, the whole thing is chaos and it's out of control. What I kind of think is happening is something similar to that is we started to mess with nature in a way. And that's what civilizations do because they say we don't want to It's like the Tower of Babel thing. We don't want to live the way God made us to live or frame that however you want, right? You can take the religiosity out of it, but but we don't want to live how nature intends us to. We want to change it. We want to control the food part. We want to control what grows. We want to control when we have access to these animals. We want to control temperature. We want to control climate. We want to control every aspect of our life. Every time we do that, we create a new problem. We try to solve that problem with more technology that creates new problems that then the next generation has to solve. This has been stacking on itself to the point that now the entire ecosphere is unraveling right before us, right? But we don't have Merlin to step in and take the hat back and fix it, right? So that's the situation we're in. It's not just that they're based on fear, but they're based on hubris thinking that we 
have a plan. We've thought of something with our brains that's going to be better than how the rest of nature works. If we can just tame it, if we can just domesticate it, if we can just control it. Um, one of the toughest parts about that for people is that they don't realize, you know, you see how people are looking for fulfillment and they're trying so hard, but I don't think it lies in there. You know, the things that are most fulfilling to me are the time I spend in nature, right? The time that I'm connected with the rest of the world, when I'm not unplugged from what's actually going on on the planet, the actual stuff, the deer walking around in the woods, the plants growing, the seasons, the wind, the rain, you know, the actual stuff. I'm most fulfilled when I have a connection to that. If I don't, I'm suffering a lot. And if I try to find the solution to that in anything ranging from money to sex to glamour to fame to any of those kind of things, they, they all feel pale. They don't quite, they never satisfy. It's like smoking cigarettes, like the satisfaction that doesn't ever satisfy you. You know, you can keep chasing it and chasing it, but all along the, the kinds of things that happen in nature and the sovereign relationships that we have with other individuals that aren't based on control those are the things that really fulfill us, I think. And that's what we, that's what we originally had. Yeah. Uh, I heard you, I heard you speak really profoundly about death. And I want to touch on that. Um, being a hunter gatherer, you know, your, 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 the death that you experience in, in hunting an animal and what that, what that opens up for you. Um, and I, I think it relates to so much of what's happening now in, in the world where, and I'm observing it, I'm just like, I'm just stunned, but it's, just, it's this direction where people, they really view death as an enemy. Like death is something that shouldn't exist. It shouldn't happen. It's a bad thing. Um, don't want to acknowledge it. Don't want to, I think, you know, speaking of like the civilization factor, most of us, most of us in America have probably never even seen someone die or experienced someone die, you know, um, or an animal die. Um, so it feels to me like there's some kind of wisdom in death that we're missing as a, as a society. I'd love you to speak to that. Well, yeah, if you lived at any other time in history, except now you would have been more, way more intimate with it, particularly human death. I mean, everybody would have been uh, intimate with animal death. I don't see how you could have escaped that, right? Where would you have? That's the whole point of the story of Buddha is like the whole point was that his parents created an environment where he wouldn't have to see any of that. Yeah. The reason that story is so powerful is because of how impossible that is. Think about the wealth that you would have to have had at that time. Think about how much control and power you would have had to have had at that time in history to completely shield somebody such that they don't know that death or disease even exists. I mean, that's a very interesting story, right? Because of, that's why it's so powerful. Um, there's just been no time in history where you wouldn't have seen your food go from a living thing into uh, something you can eat. Like um, what we, that's the power of this thing, processed food. Processing food is taking an animal or a plant in its whole form and breaking it down to the thing that we eat, right? Today, we have processed food so that we don't, and by the way, when you go buy celery at the store, that's a processed food. I'll tell you what, that's not what the celery looked like when it was in the ground. It had leaves and roots, didn't look like that. It's been partially processed, right? So even the stuff we think of, most people have never really seen a lettuce plant. They wouldn't recognize it. You know what I mean? It's, it's this stuff's interesting to me because even the things we think of as unprocessed are usually processed. So if I gave you a whole living deer, that's unprocessed, right? So the, just the fact that everybody was involved in food processing meant that they were much more intimate with death. But then at the human level, where could you have gone in history where you wouldn't have been watching your relatives pass? You wouldn't have been watching friends pass. You would have seen tremendous infant mortality. Uh, if we were doing a field guide to natural humans, one entry would tell us that the natural and normal, the biologically normal infant mortality for humans is about 50%. Now, this is completely shocking to us today because we intervene to in such a way that we prevent that. Uh, it leads to the 
paradox of our population issue, which is something that we don't often like to talk about. Um, that was one of the many checks that were on our population growth is that many people didn't make it through infancy. So you would have seen infants passing. So by the time you were an adult, you would have, I don't, you wouldn't be hardened to it. It would just be part of living intimate with death and much more prepared for your own death. If you are shielded from death your entire life, such that, as you mentioned before, most of us, very few people I know have witnessed people die. Now, if you worked in hospice or you work in EMS or you work in an emergency room or you're somebody who sat with the dying process with another person, that's different, but most of us haven't. So very few people even see a, a dead body. And when we do, at a wake, it's wearing makeup and, and all dressed up to appear alive still. In fact, we could go further. Our fear of death is such that we have developed several techniques to keep our bodies from ever being reclaimed into the natural organic system. So I will burn my body so that I am only ashes so no organic compounds in my body can make their way back into the soil. I will pickle myself in formaldehyde and put myself in a casket that's then surrounded by concrete so that no insects or invertebrates can get to me so that my body can never be reclaimed into the system. Like a trying to cheat death even in our death, right? So some psychologists say that that fear of death is a compulsor that uh, it's creates a compulsion in us to do anything we can to avoid reminders of death because any reminder of death reminds us of how afraid we are to die. There's been a lot of psychological work done on this, a lot of studies done on this. For me, I feel very lucky to encounter death very regularly through the process of hunting. So that death, to me, I see not just things die, but I see them then consumed and turned into life. That's the really important thing. It's not just getting comfortable with death. It's getting comfortable with the idea that death begets life and that that's the only way. Again, in this dimension, we can't escape that. So when you look at many other religions or spiritual paths, there's often um, some way out of this in another life, in another dimension. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth with no death, or we can escape the wheel of rebirth or, you know, some way to get to a higher dimension, but we're not there on this planet. This is how it works. Dead things get eaten by living things and they create more life. And that's the cycle here. But we've gotten so divorced from that again, through the way that we have our food produced. It's fascinating, right? Just literally through food production, such that we never have to see any of it. Now with the advent of processed, industrially processed food or commercially processed food, we don't even have to see a lettuce plant get turned into baby greens or whatever. We don't see any of it. So yeah, I think what it's left people with is like a deep, deep sense of confusion. And then all it takes is anybody to push on the death fear. And I don't just mean politicians or governments. I mean, this is true of a lot of um, spiritual charlatans do this. Um, man, uh, cults do this all the time, right? You just push on the death fear and that'll make people really, uh, that'll soften people up to what you want to deliver next. So for me, the, it's, I, I have found some, through the practice of hunting, but I assume there's lots of ways that people could um, remind themselves of death and not in, and the thing is, is that even if you look in our culture, which really draws so much from the Judeo-Christian traditions, but we look at death as a evil character, a scary yeah. evil character, right? Grim, Grim Reaper with the, you know. Exactly. So it's like a thing that comes to steal something from you. Yeah. Uh, this is a really unfortunate thing. Cause if you say to somebody, Hey, like a, it's helpful to have a death reminder. They're like, why would I want that? Sounds so negative. It's like, no, your, your framing of death is what's negative. Uh, so if we can reframe that a little bit, it's like, for instance, just behind me, you can see there's a, some skulls up there on that mantle. I mean, what are those skulls reminding me of? They're reminding me of what's right underneath the skin of my face. You know, I, I had a dental appointment where they took an x-ray of my, my face and I ended, I was like, I, I got an x-ray of my skull. I know what my skull looks like, you know? And I keep that picture around of my skull just kind of to remind me, 
Like that's what's underneath my face. And that's not like a bad thing or a negative thing. It's certainly not depressing to me or stealing any life force from me. In fact, I think it's quite liberating. Um, but people are so afraid of death that they're afraid to even look at death because they're afraid if they do, they'll descend into despair. Uh, but keep in mind that out throughout history, like every single one of your ancestors was intimate with this. Your people were hunters. Like your people were probably mammoth hunters, right? Traveling across the tundra, hunting mammoths and, and um, great aurochs, right? You, your people were intimate with this. It's just us that aren't anymore. We're living in a kind of artificial reality. And uh, in that reality, we just don't get reminded of this stuff anymore. Well, this is a very basic question I'm going to ask you, but uh, a, a big question that people have, what do you feel happens after you die? Uh, I mean, I, I, I won't pretend to know. I won't <laughs> pretend. I think it's funny people, people often answer that question. You know, I'm always like really surprised by that. I think... Uh, I guess I think, well, maybe you could say like, what, what is your approach to it? Or how do you reconcile the, how do you reconcile yeah. death? Sure. I think that it's important to have a psychological and spiritual technology at your fingertips that you can use, which is deciding to believe in something that feels right to you. I mean, I think that that's what, cause you, you look around the world and every single people group has a different story. There's some overlap, of course, but if we're really honest with ourselves, everybody's got a different creation story and a different afterlife story. Um, I have a hard time believing like one of them is right and the rest of them are wrong or something like that. It just seems to me like what you need is a consistent story you tell yourself. I think that's because <laughs> you can't know. I, I spent my 20s like trying to find the, somebody who knows. Mm -hmm. Know what I mean? What a fool's errand. The idea that somehow somebody could know that. I think that the exploration of some of the entheogenic plant medicines or animal-based plant medicines or even some of the pharmacologically derived plant-like uh, plant medicines can give us glimpses into what happens when our neurology starts to shut down or get flooded with some of the molecules that come at the death experience. And they might give us tastes. I like to think that they do. And I like to think that those experiences and encounters prepare you for it. Um, but I think, you know, I don't believe in like, a. I love the idea. I love the, the Native American, cause many tribes talk about this idea of a happy hunting ground. I got an old friend of mine who he says, Dan, God's prepared a good happy hunting ground for us. We're going to have some good stories up there. I love that. You know, I love it. But I mean, I don't really think that's true. But the idea that um, when my when my body's electricity ceases, um, that my consciousness ends intuitively doesn't feel right to me either. Um, I don't think that energy can really be destroyed in this dimension. And I'm certainly moved, my body can move, therefore has energy. So I don't see how that can be destroyed. But I also don't think uh, that we would take our ego or form with us either. But ultimately, I don't know. And I don't, I'm not going to pretend to. I just think it's important that you have something that creates and engenders good, open-hearted, uh, loving feelings so that when you think about death, there's something positive there. The idea that you could go be with your ancestors is, I'm I, I really don't think it's just a fairy tale. I think it's a technology to say that to yourself. I think the biggest thing for me that's coming up is it, this, this, you know, dealing with the reality of death, uh, accepting the reality of death, in the physical form anyway, it, it, it I, th I feel like it makes us really have appreciation and gratitude for this moment. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. this moment is, is temporary and it's not going to, you know, we don't take it for granted. Um, so that's the, that, I think that's the most positive thing that I, that I cut, get from kind of like living with death, so to speak. Right. It's mm -hmm. like, you kind of have a sense of like every moment is, is temporary, appreciate it. Um, the next one's not guaranteed. That's kind of like the wildness for me is like, nothing's guaranteed. Um, there is danger, accept it, embrace it. Yeah. Um, you know, and I guess that's the other thing too, I feel is like accepting, because there's this thing of like, if you always want to be safe and safety, because I, you know, I feel like there's so much emphasis now on safety. Like there's like, obviously safety has some 
value but it's like yeah. we've kind of gone really to an extreme of like safety mm-hmm. is the most important thing at all times and there's kind of this deadening quality when you're just yeah. okay i'm yeah. i'm safe i'm comfortable i'm safe i'm comfortable i'm so safe i'm so comfortable that there's this like a, some danger um some unknown uh really makes us feel alive there's there's an ex- yeah. exciting you know and some some healthy balance of that feels uh important in terms of rewilding. Yeah. You know, there's this thing that, uh, many of the, uh, tribal peoples around the world are much freer with their children and what they let their children do. Like a lot less of this concern about if they hurt themselves to a level that to us today would look negligent yet they had, and they did have high mortality for their children, but the ones who survive were very strong people, you know? Today, I saw, I, man, it makes me laugh all the time. Like every screen in my house has a little warning on it with a picture of a kid falling out a window. <laughs> yeah. And every five gallon bucket I have has a little warning on it of a picture of a kid drowning in the bucket. To me, I mean, how far do you take this, right? How much of your life do you spend building railings on everything and putting up fences and putting up gates? Like how much of our, like you said before, like you're here, this is a limited, limited time engagement. Right. So how much of that life time and how much of that life force do you put into trying to pad everything? Certainly you need to, there's a balance, but I don't think we're living in a very balanced way. And lately the rhetoric about safety has gone to a level that is absurd. Yep. I agree. Yeah. Amazing moment in history. (laughs) <laughs> and by the way, I think like a big part for me has I've had to really step back and reassess my relationship to current events um, because it was stealing my joy. And it was time for me to center back into my heart because what I realized is that pushing back against it, it can contribute to it in a way. Right. Right. Yeah. And yeah. before I know it, I'm angry. And then when I'm angry, I am not contributing to anything good on the earth. I'm actually contributing negativity to the earth. So as we probe this stuff, and I feel where you're, I feel your questions. I understand what you're asking me. And I know I'm sort of skirting around the edges of what you're asking me, but it's because of that practice of saying, like, I can't give this thing any more energy. That doesn't mean I'm not aware. And that doesn't mean I don't see what's happening. It's that I want to live every moment of my life. I've already given enough to it, you know? And that doesn't mean I won't fight it when the time comes, but this isn't that time. This is uh, the preamble. And I'm gonna just live as much joy as I can. Because to me, what I see is that love and joy actually are the medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, when we were talking about suffering before, and I know the Buddhist idea is like, hey, when you're feeling joy, there's the seed of sufferings there because it will end, right? Because joy can't be permanent. So I understand that conceptually. But when I'm feeling love and joy, I certainly don't feel like I'm suffering, you know? No. So that's to me is, is, is antidote or medicine at least. Mm-hmm. So trying to find that uh, and trying to con- and continuing to do what I know I'm here to do, what's like my mission mm-hmm. um, so that I'm not waylaid because I've been watching especially amongst influencers right now, it's interesting to watch how many influencers are being pulled off of their mission by all of this stuff. It's happening a lot. Some people, I think that's probably their new mission. And I understand that, but some people have gotten pulled off and and now they're walking a new path. And it's sort of like that, uh, you know, it's interesting, like when Anakin Skywalker becomes Darth Vader kind of a thing. I think that's what we have to be careful of as we watch the erosions of freedom, real simple ones, like the ability to just share your opinion and think like, oh, aren't I allowed to do that? Those kind of things. Yeah. That stuff, I mean, that makes me angry and it makes everybody angry, right? But I don't want anger to define how I'm moving in the world, at least not anymore. I've played that game enough. And so um, I've chosen to combat this thing with my heart and not with my mind because, man, my mind is flawed compared to my heart. My heart's a way better compass. Well, what's interesting is I feel like your purpose, I mean, let's, let's, let's kind of segue into this. I feel like your purpose is my senses. It is the answer to a lot of what ails us right now. Um, 
So how about we kind of segue into like yeah. some positive ways of contributions. People can make a positive shift in, um, you know, what, how, how do you feel people can make a positive shift and what's where we are right now? And, and you I know, think on, people a pers- should, on a personal I th- level, I think people can get outside more and less as, um, outside's not a movie theater. It's not a spectator sport. I mean, in an interactive way. So yeah, it's really good to go walk around in your backyard or to go walk on a trail. That's really good. That's a really good place to start, but that's kind of like training wheels. Ultimately, I think what's really important is going out and actually making connections with species that live in the environment. So for instance, we call often uh, friends of mine, we refer to this thing we call the wall of green. And we say that people go outside and they walk down, let's say you're walking down a nature path and what people are seeing on either side is just a sort of vague wall of green. If they might know, well, those are trees and that's a plant, that's a herb or something, but it's like very vague sense. So if you were like, okay, once a week, I'm going to learn a new tree species. Before you know it, now you're walking down the trail and you're like, oh, that's a white pine. Oh, that's a balsam fir. Oh, that's a northern white cedar. That's a red maple. That's a red oak. And over time, what happens is you start to get to know the other living creatures that you share your environment with. Because right now what's happened is we're fully alienating ourselves from our environment we have this hilarious contradiction going on where we're all going around talking about how much we care about that environment. And then you're like, so show me the environment you care so much about. And it's like, well, here's my wall of green. (laughs) It's like, yeah, I don't think you actually know the environment though. Let's go meet who lives there. Because it'd be like if you moved to a neighborhood and you didn't know anybody who lived in the neighborhood, you wouldn't really be part of it part of that community. So similarly, like as a homo sapien, I'm one of the animals that lives on the planet. I share this habitat where I live with a lot of other animals, which the process of hunting has been a way and fishing has been a way for me to get to know those animals. Some people think like, how cruel, you're just killing them. It's like, well, I actually know who lives here. Do you know who lives here? You might not like my practice, but it actually brings me intimately in contact with these living creatures. I think I probably care more about them than you because you don't know them. And I I think I would be more likely to help conserve and preserve them because I know them versus just this vague idea of caring about it all. Foraging is really similar. So foraging is this way where I get really close to plants and to mushrooms. So not everybody needs to hunt and gather, obviously. Not everyone can. But just getting out and learning some of the things that live on your lawn, because what's a really beautiful experience is when you're out walking around and you start to look around and you're like, man, I know some of these creatures. I know some of these entities and I have relationship with them. And then humans realize they're not alone. But right now, the way we're acting is like we're alone. And I often liken it to as if we were astronauts from another planet who landed here and it's like, oh, this isn't our planet. So I'm not going to get to know anybody here. It's like when you are in relationship with the species around you, you're from here. You start to have the sense of being a native earthling, an indigenous earthling. You know, there's all this talk I know like around the social politics of who's native and who's indigenous and all that. And of course, I understand what and honor what that means, but we all are from earth. We're all indigenous to the planet, but many of us have not lived like that. So I think some big solutions are, starting maybe just taking walks outside, but over time starting to get to know, hey, that's a dandelion and that's chicory and they look kind of alike, but they're not the same. And that's Mm -hmm. a wild lettuce. And oh, wow, that's where all the lettuce plants came from. That's crazy. They were domesticated out of that. And like, hey, what bird is that? Or what bird call was that? All that kind of stuff. You start to become interwoven into something bigger than you. And uh, two things I want to say about that. If you're not woven into that, you won't care about really protecting it. And two, one of the things that calms the fear of death is feeling like you're part of something bigger than yourself. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that that I didn't mention it, but that was I would say that was the biggest part of my uh, spiritual journey, if you want to use that term, was spending time in nature, you know, and, and literally just a lot of times just sitting in nature for hours and just observing and watching the movement of things. And you just see how everything's connected to everything and everything is in, in this cycle that just moves. And, and then it's like, oh, yeah, and I'm a part of this cycle. You know, I'm a yeah. part of this, too. And, and kind of just re remembering that or reconnecting to that. So, so I love that. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for, for, for that. Um, yeah, you were, I, I know you have like a bunch of different ways of like, you know, kind of rewilding that people can do or different, different practices they can do. So anything you want to like run through there, anything you want to, you share that, that people could implement, um, that kind of bring them back physically um, but also on a conscious level, you know, physically, mm -hmm. I feel like it's all connected anyway, but physically, mentally, you know, spiritually. Yeah. I think that, uh, one of the things about domestication and, um, one of the things civilization's always trying to achieve is like this, um, flat line in almost everything. So for instance, the flat line would be, uh, one example would be like temperature. So, mm -hmm. Remember, the human human body is lazy for a reason. The reason is because the natural environment is so hard that, of course, you want to create conditions where you don't have to struggle so much. The problem is the conditions that we have now are so easy. So it's kind of like um, the reason you love the taste of sweet is because you're supposed to look in nature for sweet. The problem is when you have so much sweet that you can make yourself diabetic with it. We love fat in our mouth because fat's one of these things we're supposed to be looking in our environment for. It's hard to find good quality fat when you're hunting and gathering. So you have this mouth feel for fat, of course, right? The problem is you can go buy a hundred sticks of butter and eat them all today if you want. That was never possible before. So many of the things that are built into us are there for our benefit, but in this environment can be a detriment. So of course we want to feel comfortable in our temperature, right? But you look at what society's done, it's created a world where everything is 65 to 70 all the time. And one thing that's interesting to me, having gotten to go a few places in the world, if you're in the desert, it's real hot in the day and it's real cold at night. And if you're in the jungle, it's real hot in the day and it's real cool at night. And if you're anywhere in the world, it's warmer in the day and colder at night. And so the human body actually needs the stresses of going warm and going cool and going warm and going cool. What we try to do is like, we have all our clothes and our boots and our, everything dialed just perfect. So we never feel anything. So challenging yourself and your thermal regulation is like one of those things. It's just really good for you. I like to use a sauna. I like to go out in the cold. My wife and I are getting ready for ice fishing. And it's like, we're going to be standing out on the ice in the cold, exposed to the elements. Like you get cold and it's good for you. You know, it's just like one example. On the food piece, I think working your way back from the food that you eat now to, to foods that you can actually, you know that thing people say like, um, if you can't pronounce the ingredient, it's probably not good for you. There's like that kind of saying, yeah. I, so, sort of like that, except if you can't identify what species that food is, remember every food is a species or it leaked out of a, there's a couple of small exceptions. Like you could say like, well, what about milk? Okay, milk leaked out of a species. It's a liquid tissue from a, you know, what about honey? Okay, it leaked out of bees. It's a, you know, but every other food is like a creature's body parts. If you can't identify what the body parts were, or you don't know what they came from, hmm, there's something to look at. Maybe you could look at more whole foods and um, kind of making connections to some more natural food sources. Doesn't mean it has to always be that way. Doesn't mean you can't have cheats and splurges and all those things, but it'd be good if you started making up your diet from things that you can recognize. And you can do that through, you know, quality shopping at good markets. You can do that with farmer's markets and making connections to local food. It's a really, really helpful way that you can begin to rewild your physiology. I think drinking really clean water and making sure that you have a good clean water source is really, really important. You know, one of the things that makes us super ultra dependent is when we don't have the ability to source our own bloodstream. So, right, <laughs> the, the liquids in your body. So having like a good, clean source of that, having natural movement in your life and a mix of things that are always changing. Imagine the hunting and gathering environment. It's changing week to week, season to season. I mean, my just my calendar as a modern 
hunter gatherer who's just doing it as a practice, but could go buy all my food if I wanted. My calendar is set up around all these different activities, all these different seasons, and I need to be able to do lots of different things. So my exercise needs to be a reflection of that. The body needs to do lots of things and it needs to do things that are difficult, lifting things that are heavy. It needs to do things cardiovascularly that require endurance. So we need to build all of that kind of stuff in too. And I could go on and on and on. A lot of these just really end up looking like regular good advice, eat good, drink clean water, get exercise, right? Sweat, all those kind of things. But the more of those we stack on top of each other, the more we're recreating the ancestral environment in our, nat in our modern lives and the more our bodies will start to get strong. And I think there's a, there's a pretty good correlation between a healthy, strong body and a good, healthy consciousness. I know there's exceptions to that. You, know, you meet that occasional like unwell, enlightened kind of character. But for the most part, you know, I find my consciousness is very much tied to my health and my well-being. So I think that ultimately it's good to remember that there's this idea um, in physiology of hormesis. And hormesis means that that small amounts of things that aren't good for you are good for you. So like mm. exercise damages your tissues, but in the right amount, you grow back stronger. And this is true of a lot of plant medicine. I don't mean entheogenic plant medicine here, but I just mean like herbal medicine, the, the medicines that are in plants. Most of them are subtle poisons, but they're also medicinal in very small amounts. So when we get exposed to those things, we actually come back stronger. So a lot of things are that way. If you get exposed to a lot of cold, but you don't push it to the point of, of severe damage, your metabolism will come back in such a way as to have a, a better furnace inside. So remember that you talked about before about the safety thing, and we could almost kind of group it with comfort. You yeah, know? yeah, definitely. It's so yeah. important. And I think it's important yeah. to have comfort, but it's important to challenge your comfort too. It's so important to have, have discomfort, both. yeah. Yeah, both, you need yeah. both. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think those are yeah. the kind of things that really rewild us. And then ultimately, man, if you can just get outside and start to learn a little bit about who lives where you live, keep in mind, most people are better at identifying animals of the African savanna than they are of the animals of their own <laughs> landscape. No, I mean, that sounds like I'm joking, right? But you know, no, it's true. That's true. Yeah. Most people I could start showing Zebras them pictures. Yeah, yeah, rhinos. exactly. That's a rhino yeah. that and then it'd be like, what's this? And it's like, I don't never saw that animal. It's like, well, that's a possum. It's the only marsupial yeah. in North America it lives right outside your door. It's like, there's a lot of that kind of thing where we don't know who lives where we live. So it doesn't take much to get an Audubon field guide to your area or, you know, for plants or for animals or whatever it is and start paying attention to what's happening outside so that you, you don't feel 100% reliant on the comforts that civil or not just the comforts, but the life support that comes from civilization, right? Like what, what, what the, what our culture has done to all the wild peoples of the world has made them completely dependent because they were so independent. There was no way to control that. So it's like, we're at this point where our food and our water and our medicine, everything comes from this hand of the domesticator almost, right? Metaphorically. And so one of the most empowering things about hunting and gathering, and I do it in a legal structure, right? It's not like I can just go out willy nilly. I mean, I'm still having to abide by all these laws and all this stuff. But when I go out and do that, I know how to get my protein. I know how to get my carbohydrates. I know how to get my fats. I know where to get water. I can live off of that a little bit better. And that gives me the sense of sovereignty and independence. So, it's a long process for domesticated people to become sort of feral and rewild a bit, but you got to start the journey. So if the journey is taking a walk in your city park, like that's where you start, but always adding a little bit more. It's like exercise. If you don't keep changing it, it gets boring. So it's not just every day walk in the park. It's like, okay, today my goal walking in the park is I'm going to try to identify this plant or this bird or whatever it is and, and let nature be your guide because nature is your compass right now. At least nature's my compass right now because I know it doesn't lie and I'm hearing a lot of lies. So I, <laughs> I use nature as a guide because it's been honest all along and at least it's a, it always points true. And we forget that we are nature, right? So it's like, that's it's it. a reflection of us. It's that's the biggest lie we, right there. Yeah, that's the biggest lie. <laughs> um, how about, um, one of the things I've looked at a lot is, um, sex and sexuality in terms of rewilding it feels like there's been so much repression and suppression of our innate 
sex, sexuality through the civil, civilizing process. And to me, there's a couple of different things that's happening there. But one is it, it really, I think if you're really suppressing anything inside yourself energetically, you're, you're kind of uh, losing your vitality, you're losing your life force. Um, so it feels like there's, and I've heard you talk about this a little bit, there's some way to kind of acknowledge that or reintegrate that as a part of this rewilding process. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a lot I want to say on that. You know, I talked about it a lot in my past. I would interview a lot of people on it in my mm -hmm. own personal quest. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a subject that I'm going to, I'm going to leave that one alone. I think that one's a really personal one for people. So I'm not going to really mm -hmm. touch that one if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. No problem. Yeah. No, I just, for myself, I've just found that like, there's, there's a way to like access that energy and then you can channel in different ways. And, you know, yeah, well, I would say I, what I will say about it, like for my wife and I, that, that that's another place that for us is a personal practice. Mm -hmm. So for we achieve states through lovemaking that I can't achieve on my own states that are very similar to states that can be achieved through the use of entheogens, for instance, mm -hmm. but that have more holistic components and are generated mm -hmm. from inside. I think to do that though, when you get into those communities, part of why I don't really feel like commenting on is when I get around any of those communities, I think it's sort of like what you were talking about before. You were sort of, I'll paraphrase and take, say what I took from what you were saying before about a lot of the spiritual communities is they start to seem like psychologically masturbatory after a while. <laughs> right, 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 right. You know, yeah. Yeah. what I see in the Tantra world, for instance, is which is like, and again, it's like modern yoga, right? Like there's yoga as was developed in India. And then there's like Americans take on yoga in the modern world. And they're not necessarily the same thing, right? So we yeah. look at like Tantra, for instance, and it's like the modern, our modern take on it a lot of times is all about they use the right words and they talk about it, but it's like the thing that really makes it work is two people with compatibility who can open their hearts fearlessly without having shadows between them of the things that have built up and accumulated that they don't share. Mm -hmm. If you have that going on, then you can't really reach those ecstatic states of union. But yeah. I think when you clear that stuff out and you're, you meet authentically with open hearts, at least in my experience, we, we are able to achieve states that to us feel like part of our personal evolution so that sex is not just, and I don't say this to sound pretentious because to me, it almost, I almost feel pretentious saying it, but it's like, to me, sex can, is this amazing opportunity for personal evolution. Or mm -hmm. it can just be like scratching your back too, if you want it to be. And it can be both, you know, mm -hmm. so that it's like sometimes like the, in the Tantra world, it can almost seem like um, the pleasure has gone out of it because it's so technical. Yeah. Or it's really just pleasure seeking masked in the language of spirituality. Right. It seems right. to me that both things are absolutely available, but um, you know, part of the magic is being with the right person and part of the magic is being the right person and then both people being willing to fearlessly open their hearts i mean again i know i keep coming back to this idea of the heart but if you don't have that it's really hard to through the mind or the body alone achieve you know higher states but i think there are incredible states of consciousness available to us through sex and i don't know if i would correlate that with rewilding or not i almost think some of that are because there are certainly benefits to civilized living that that our ancestors did not get to experience certain aspects of self-actualization i think this might be one of them you know there's been interesting studies for instance on other mammals where they've wanted to see because because most mammals and even some animals like alligators in the um crocodilians have clitorises. So there's been work done to see like, well, can females of these, these animals do not appear to be orgasmic in nature, but can they be? And some of that research indicates that, yeah, probably they can, which means that innately the cosmic giggle has implanted the potential for sexual evolution in these animals, but they haven't achieved it yet. And I think that we have opportunities today because we have awesome hygiene and we have very, you know, we've surrounded ourselves with very 
clean environments. Like we have opportunity to explore states that I don't think has always been available to our ancestors. So it's almost, um, it's not really relating to rewilding, but I do think that there, there are some serious potential there that a lot of people are never tapping into. Well, that ended up being a very interesting answer, actually. <laughs> so <laughs> grateful for that. And just to, just to clarify, um, I'm also, what I was, what I was pointing at too is like, not, I guess, within oneself. So like, um, allowing the energy to flow within oneself. Yeah. Um, and then obviously coming into a relationship with someone else as well. And then all the, all the benefits that come from that. But, yeah. but yeah, um, I, I'd love to hear, um, if there's anything that you visualize on a collective level, on a global level, like let's say like there's the, the awakening of rewilding consciousness, really, you know, kind of the, the tipping point happens and we're as a, as a species, we're in this, like, what does it look like? What do you, you know, what do you see in your mind's eye? I think that there needs to be some merging of the two paradigms, the wild paradigm and um, this Western scientific paradigm. Because the Western scientific paradigm, with all of its problems of reductionism and um, godlessness, maybe be a way to say that, um, the, it's, it's, it's very fascinating to look at because the technologies we create, like people will point to science and say, well, look how incredible science is. Look what it can create. And it's like, yeah, but all those things seem to be just creating lots of destruction. It'd be like, yeah, look, we can build iPhones. It's like, yeah, but we have to strip mine the earth to do it. It's like, yeah, we can build all these incredible gadgets. Yeah, but we need like polluting factories to do it, which displace living things that lived where the factory was before the factory was there. And, you know, so the technology seems to create a lot of problems, but the science, I have a hard time judging it it's a very powerful way to look at the world. But if it is not tempered with a spiritual paradigm or an ecological paradigm, then it's out of control. So science out of control is really, really dangerous. And I think one of the things we can see right now we're really confronted with is it's kind of we're in this environment. Science as it's supposed to be objective, right? It's supposed to be objective, yeah. which means you and I could arrive at this. We, we should arrive at the same results. But we're at this weird moment where it's like, whose science are we talking about? Yep. Sure seems like there's a lot of conflicting science out there and everybody's got the studies to back it up, right? Because there's no, science has no moral compass. And one of the things we see from the past is incredible moral compass. Even if we don't agree with the morality, at least there was internal consistency in cultures. You know what I mean? So I think we have to like start to merge these things in some way. So, I, you know, the... The ecological and um, spiritual ways of our ancestors and of people in the not too distant past that hunted and gathered, that deep ecological integration needs to infiltrate or merge with our scientific understanding. I, don't, I, I hope that we don't lose our understanding of what space is of what stars are. Like, I would hate to see all that lost. Like, I don't want to return to a time where we don't know any of that anymore. And I just look up and, and I go, no, that's the, those are our ancestors up there. It's like, I want to, I want, I don't mind believing that, but I also want to know, well, yeah, but my ancestors are made out of massive nuclear reactions that are taking place in the vacuum of space. Like both things just, we need to figure out how to merge it. But right now what's going on is our scientific paradigm is suppressing all other paradigms. And it looks like where it's headed is to a much more draconian way of doing that. Um, a, a sort of, we can use the scientific paradigm to create a sort of brave new world 1984 scenario, you know, almost looks like that's where it's headed. So we need to temper that with something else. And I think it's the merging of these two things. I don't feel the need to be out there. I'm not called to be out there promoting the parts of civilization that are valuable because I think we already know that. I feel called to promote the parts of wildness that are important and valuable. But I do think that those things need to merge somehow. And that's interestingly the prophecy of a lot of native peoples um, as they sort of gave way to um, colonization. Prophecies would emerge that said, hey, these two things will one day come together like the, so. the eagle and the condor 
Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I can't speak to that particularly, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's some others like the seven fires prophecy and stuff like that. So I would like to see something like that happen. Um, Cause we've, we've learned a lot since the enlightenment, but it's like, we use it wrong. You know, it's like the, it's like you, you, you gave a chimpanzee a machine gun or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, we don't know how to use the tool properly. So I think if we could get back our, our moral and spiritual compass, we might be better at wielding these incredibly powerful tools. But um, we also run, let's not, not, let's not put our heads in the sand. We run an incredible risk right now of causing an ecological catastrophe. And we're survivors. We've survived a lot as a species. So we have that potential too. You know, we have the potential, I think, to pull through this thing in the most beautiful way or to create a collapse. And I think we also need to really come to terms with the fact that the, the era of this empire is probably over. You know, something new is going to emerge. Um, I think what is so important is that each person carries out their mission right now. Like when I was born from my earliest memories, I felt such a strong sense of purpose. And now looking back, I kind of think it's because we are living through the end of an empire. And so people are, many people are called to steward that process, almost like um, hospicing the death of somebody, right? So I think that I, you know, I'll do my part, you do your part, everybody does their part so we can get through this thing very smoothly because one paradigm is ending and a new paradigm is emerging. And there are a lot of forces at the table right now, some of which would like to hijack that. And we have to make sure to not let that happen. You know what I'm saying? Like there's, um, there's in a time of chaos, sometimes people try to take advantage of that and we can kind of see that happening. So it's just really important, I think, that everybody at an individual level walks out their purpose and they don't get, that's why I said before, try not to get distracted by all the things that are designed to make you afraid or angry because then you're not doing your purpose, you know? And totally, I think yeah. if you don't do that, we become susceptible to um, another dark age. But I think that can be avoided. I think it, sh it, it can easily be avoided, um, but it's gonna take people having that compass. Do you see us moving forward in like a network of like tribal communities? Um, you know, not, not going back to the past, but some sort of new Yeah, well, version? I think that I, I see an end to globalization as we kind of know mm -hmm. it now. Um, even just this kind of the early state, you know, back in March, April, May, where of 2020, when it was like, oh, whoa, the globalization leaves everybody in a situation that's really vulnerable. So I think that there's going to be a natural shift just with business and investment, money, factories, all that kind of stuff away from globalization to something that's more locally based out of necessity. Not at it. I don't see it happening immediately out of like ethics. Like everybody's like, oh, it'll just be better. But I think that even, you know, investors are going to be like, hey, we need to have local supply chains. We need to know that they, even if they're a little more expensive, we need to have that reliability. So I think there's going to be a little bit of a movement away from globalization over time. And um, I do think that people are going to have to start drawing on community strength again. However, we also, have to be aware that the young generation right now is going to want to explore the virtual environment, which unlike the exploration of the planet is sort of limitless in its scale. Like it was like, there's only so much of the earth to be discovered. Whereas in the virtual environment, theoretically, if you could maintain the infrastructure could be infinite. So I think that there's going to be a lot of competing forces. There's going to be people who we are going to start to want to know our neighbors again we are going to start to have to rely on each other for some goods again. We, it looks like some of the basic fundamentals of how American capitalism has worked are going to change in ways that many of us don't want it to, but seem like they're going to. And some are, and, and keep in mind too, like there's so many things we say are insustainable, like they can't be sustained. So that means they have to change anyway, right? They have to, because they can't be sustained. So as everything's changing, I think people are going to have to rely locally again, but I don't see a utopia coming out of that. I want to be clear. I, I think that this idea of chasing utopia is one of the ways we've been fooled over and over and over again. 
you know, my wife and I have been watching um, a doc kind of docu series on Scientology, just trying to understand like how did these people get roped into this? Mm -hmm. But it's the same old story, man. It's utopia and afterlife and the end of suffering and all that kind of stuff. Personal power, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, we got to be careful of all that stuff, you know. But uh, I don't think there's going to be a utopia. But I do think just out of need, our food systems will probably get a little more local again. You know, everything I noticed in my own lifetime, I've watched just pendulums one way and the other way. And I think we've gone kind of as far as we can go with this globalized idea. So I think it's going to swing in the other direction. And there's a grassroots swell. But um, yeah, we're going to have to contend with this technology we've built too. And and. That's again, why I think it's so important people spend time outside and get their kids outside so that kids know that an outside even exists. Because right now it seems silly to say like, an out of course, everyone knows outside exists. Okay, but what about in 20 years? Will they know then? Because if they grow up in one of those VR headsets or whatever exists in 20 years, will they even know an outside exists? Or will what will outside be? Like you take off your headset and you're in your little chamber. Is the chamber now the outside? Do you know what I mean? People yeah. might not know if we're not careful. So we have to be, ah, it's like we have to stay human, you know? But, well, yeah. So do you, do you see like um, we're all going to move forward? I know we don't know for sure what's going to happen, but just, you know, kind of have a fun speculation here. Yeah, yeah. We're all going to move forward into an integrated space together or so there's some speculation that we're kind of going different directions and there's going to be like the stay human group and the techno yeah. whatever transhuman group yeah i don't think that the transhuman group will have room for the nature group unfortunately <laughs> right that's true I, that you know and <laughs> you know experience shows that so i do see that there's that bifurcation is taking place you have this incredible movement towards local organic farming or the kind of extreme end of it that i'm into with wild foods you have this this whole movement of like back to the land going on and simultaneously, you have transhumanism at this new level, right? It's gaining so much traction. So we are bifurcating. The thing is, is that I think the people who are into nature are kind of like live and let live. But the people who are into um, transhumanism seem like they would do the same thing that the Europeans did to the native peoples of the world, right? So the question is, is this Atlantis? In other words, in our great hubris, you know, the story of Atlantis, again, you know, I, I don't believe literally in Atlantis. I want to be clear about that, but I love the, the story. I think it did come from Plato, Socrates. I'm not sure. I don't remember now either. Anyway, the story is passed down for so long. And part of that story is that they had great technology, powerful technology, but they destroyed themselves with that technology. Right. So will the, is transhumanism, his, is transhumanism even possible or will it collapse on itself? Um, if it does, I know, I mean, the solution's obvious. People have to get food and water and go back to the land for that. That's where that stuff comes from. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but I, I, I don't think that this idea, like, I don't see a future that's like a John Lennon song. I just don't, I, history doesn't show that to be how, um, it's not how we work we, our brains are limited by what's called Dunbar's number. You know, we can, yeah. we can know intimately 150 people. That's about the size that we organized ourselves on traditionally. That's how the world's always set up. And, and it, when it was sustainable, all the groups rubbed up against each other, mated together, but had friction with each other that kept them separate in little sustainable pockets. And uh, I don't know if we can ever go back to something like what it used to be, or I'm not suggesting we will, but um, I, I would be skeptical of a, like, we all join together as one. I, d I don't picture it. I see that there are, there's an attempt to force that right now, even. Right. And what that means is, is that you have to give up what you think to then conform to what, you know, the accepted, what everyone thinks thing. I just don't see how that can work because it seems to me nature generates different paradigms in different people on purpose because you need both, right? It's like, it's kind of like healthiest if you have a mom and a dad, right? It's healthiest if you have two eyes so you can see with depth perception and have a perspective on things, right? It's healthy if you have some people who say, we need to let more people into our clan from outside. And it's also healthy if you have people who say, hey, we can't just let anybody into our clan from outside. You want both voices at the table so that balanced decisions get made. 
right? Well, that's really important what you're saying because a lot of people don't recognize that right now. You know, they, they're on the other side, the, the other uh, alternative perspective is the enemy and they must be crushed. And, you know, so that's, I think that's important. Yeah. That message, the, red, the, that, you the know. rhetoric's pretty high right now on that. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and there's some, and what's interesting about it is, is both opinions are not being represented equally. And so, mm -hmm. right, so you see the dominance of only one idea and you're seeing what looks like the early stages of, we need to re-educate these people. We need to control these disgusting, despicable people. It's like, whoa, rhetoric's getting crazy. But ultimately we do need both of those voices. That's how we stay balanced. So again, if you just let anybody into the tribe, you get foreign diseases, you get overrun, you lose your culture. If you don't let anyone into the tribe, you stagnate and die in a genetic bottleneck. You, you need both things. So you don't want to just wall everybody out, but you certainly don't want to just let everybody. It's just like, when it's everything is like that. It's balances. So yeah, I don't, I don't see a world where we all, I don't think we should all agree. I just, I'm so comfortable with that. We don't, and I don't, and I, and I like the idea though, of being able to listen to somebody else without thinking of how you're going to argue against it. You know, that would be nice. Something like that where people could actually hear each other again uh, would be beautiful right now. Mm -hmm. Here's an interesting question. Do you feel that we're evolving as a species? No. Um, <laughs> yeah. T tell me about that. I want to hear more about that. Well, I think that we're, we're, no, we're not. It's like saying, uh, are we devolving or degenerating? Yeah. So, um, I, I used to, uh, I used to lifeguard, uh, down at the beaches here in Maine. And uh, I remember this one squad I was a part of had all these photos on the wall that were pictures of every squad from every year. And if you went back like 20 years, you're looking at these people, like everybody is just this specimen of health and fitness. And then as you watched it over the years, it was like this nerdification and this emaciation and this breakdown to everybody look kind of like gangly and sick at the end, you know, like yeah, our and, squad. And, and, and now we have a real issue with obesity in this country as well. Well, it's healthy. Um, so the, uh, yeah, think about like um, a lot of people now understand what happened with um, dog domestication and that many of the breeds of dogs are actually becoming so unhealthy that they can't breathe properly anymore because their facial structure has been so changed. So take the pug as an example, like eyeballs bugging out of its head can't really actually get a real breath properly because the degeneration process that we call domestication has crowded the whole fit. But that's what's happening to us. Our, if we were evolving, our teeth would still fit in our mouth without, you know, needing braces. If we were, if we were evolving, right, we wouldn't be seeing so many um, of the degenerative diseases. We are degenerating. Uh, we're not, we wouldn't see 70% of Americans were deficient in vitamin D. I mean, how can we be evolving in, the, in those conditions? So what's happening is we're, there should be a lot more global concern about what's happening with our species and particularly with our children. But it's like, we're acting like, oh, don't worry about it. If, if we were farmers and we saw happening to our flock, what's happening to us, we would be very concerned and go, hey, how do I take better care of these animals? But we're looking at ourselves like, oh yeah, it's no big deal, don't worry about it. It's a huge mistake. And there's so many taboos at play in this that we can't even have the conversation. But, but I think that we need to take better care of ourselves physically, emotionally, mentally, sexually, spiritually. Um, if we don't, I don't wanna to be too apocalyptic here, but I just don't see a, uh, I, I, I think that there'd be that, that nature would end up kind of purging off a lot of that. It would have to, um, because how long can that go well, on? Yeah. And there, there is the theory that this viral outbreak is a part of that. It's kind of nature yeah. saying you guys are way out of balance and it's a way of kind of, yeah, I don't know, think this one is, but I think that that kind of thing is very possible. Could happen or is it, is it possible? Yeah, it yeah. definitely could happen and probably yeah. will happen. Mm -hmm. Um, but when that happens, you'll know, cause you'll look around and you'll see it actually happening. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. So these things are symptoms of basically being way out of balance with nature. And the, and the, the solution is to come back into harmony with nature. And if we, if we can do that, then these symptoms will, will uh, lessen. Right. 
I think so. But I think, you know, you, we have to do it. The, the problem, I think right now we see so much of like people trying to do it top down and it has to be bottom up. So it's like, I don't know what the world needs to do. I just know what I need to do. Right. And are you all these young voices right now telling us what the world needs to do? It's like, <laughs> it's like, okay, Greta, hang on. Why don't we work on you? Right. That's, I think how we need to do this. Um, everybody's got a solution and no experience with the implementation of that solution. So yeah, I think that we can only do it individually and we'll see how things shake out, <laughs> you know? Uh -huh. So I, my, my solutions that I'm sharing are just mine. I'm not trying to say that this is everybody's way or anybody's way, but mine. Um, but I do think that coming into some kind of alignment, you know, just like when you raise a dog, Hey, if you know how a wolf lives, you can create good conditions for your dog. Cause your dog's a wolf. If you know how natural homo sapiens live, you can recreate some of those conditions in the modern world and you'll find yourself to be healthier on all those levels I was talking about, you know, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, sexually, physically, all of those. Um, and yeah, the further we get away from that, I think the, the worse it is for us. Mm -hmm. So what do you have going on right now that people can plug into that you're excited about? Yeah, man. Uh, what I'm most excited about is my new TV show, Wild Fed. Yeah, I'm excited about it too, channel. actually. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty cool, man. It's a, it, It's been a cool process. You know, I started making the show three years ago and um, self-produced it. And then, um, you know, I've been really lucky to position it onto a cable network. And the show is about, uh, you know, I'm, I host it. And every episode I go out and uh, I hunt something or fish something, and then I gather something or multiple things, plants, mushrooms, algaes, and then we bring those ingredients to chefs. And then those chefs produce meals that people look at and go, Ooh, I want to eat that. Cause I was always frustrated with these. I would bring home these ingredients like venison or like wild turkey or cod or something like that. You know, I'd bring home ramps or maitake mushrooms. These are the ingredients that you see on fine dining restaurant menus. So you go to the most elite restaurants in the world, right? The ones that are the highest rated fine dining restaurants and the ingredients they're using are the ingredients that I'm going and getting. Yet, when you talk to people about wild foods, they just picture sticks and twigs. You know, like they imagine you like eating things that aren't good. And it's like, no, not only are they good, they're the, actually the very best ingredients. So we're taking, so, so the show is mostly us in the field getting these ingredients with this finale of us gathering everybody together who was part of that and eating together um, communally. So um, that show is on the Outdoor Channel on Mondays at uh, 7 p.m. And, uh, and a lot of people now, of course, myself included, don't have cable. So I've been using an uh, app called Friendly, F-R-N-D-L-Y, no, no vowels in there. Friendly TV gives you access to the Outdoor Channel for like six bucks a month or something, seven bucks a month. So people can see the show. But, you know, in addition to that, I got the Wild Fed podcast, which is a deepening of these ideas, you know, especially around ecology. We do a lot of focus on different plants and animals, talk to hunters, foragers, biologists, ecologists, authors, things like that. And then, um, of course, all the regular social stuff, my Instagram account at Danny Vitalis is where I write the most frequently. And I do write there. I treat that like man, more like, uh, I take it the writing seriously, more like a blog, I guess. And, um, yeah. I really do. I am passionate about both the photography and the writing. Awesome. Yeah. I'm excited about the, uh, well, I'm excited about all of that, but, um, I, I've seen some clips of the, uh, of the show and I was, yeah, I was really getting into it. I think it's killer, so, man. I, I think, yeah. I think it's really different than anything that's been done before. I'm re I'm really excited about it. And we've only released two episodes now. Um, and so there's eight to go in the, for the rest of the season. So the total, the season's total 10 episodes and uh, it's such a neat range of things. So almost everybody walks away really entertained. Um, everybody walks away with a little bit more of education and we try to really make it artistic as well. So that's our, that's what I'm shooting for. I'm shooting for art, entertainment and education, which I think is the best way to utilize the television format. But I think is just, there's been such an emphasis on entertainment. And this idea that people don't want to be educated or that people are, couldn't handle art. And it's like, man, that's not true. They, they need to be entertained in order to maybe sit through that. But people are very capable of handling all three of those. So we've got them all in there. And to me, it's a really unique and special show. And, and there's a lot of heart behind it. And DanielVitalis.com. 
Is your uh, actually where where I'm doing? I mean, that's more of a placeholder wow. now. Everything's happening over at wild-fed.com. Yeah, sweet. I blog sweet. over there and stuff. Yeah. All right, Daniel. Thanks for being here. I really enjoyed it. And, no problem, uh, thanks man. For your, I, for your wisdom and thanks for letting me that. scared around a lot of those questions. I hope that <laughs> my my meaning in my heart, I think, probably come through. Um, but this is a time where I think being the brightest light you can be is more important than ever. It's always important, but it's real important. Yeah. No, I think you actually, you, you, you gave really interesting. I mean, I thought you gave really interesting answers that were insightful for me. So um, I'm appreciative and I'm sure many others will be appreciative too. Well, it's yeah. my pleasure. Thanks for Thanks having for me. Being here.